All right, good morning. Are you ready to get into God's Word this morning? All right, grab your Bibles. We're in Hebrews chapter 11. This is the last Sunday in the faith chapter. Uh, uh, we're ending this series, but don't worry, because next week is what? Easter. Easter. So we got a great story, a great message for next week and beyond that. And, and by the way, whether you're watching online or here in the room, hang on till the end of the service. I got a special quick announcement for you. So I, I'm just going to whet your appetite with that. All right. Are you ready to get started this morning? I'm excited for the end of Hebrews chapter 11. And, and as I've been thinking about this whole series and, and this message in particular this morning, I got a question for you. And I asked the praise team to be thinking about the, this this morning. Who were your childhood heroes? Who were your heroes when you were growing up? Larry boy. I like that. And if you're online, write it in the comments. Who were your heroes when you were growing up? Anyone else? Richard Petty, Richard Petty the Lone Ranger. John Elway. John Elway. Yeah. All right. We got some booze in the crowd. That's okay. Jesus still loves you. Do you want to know what mine were? Mine were embarrassing. Are you ready for number one? Underdog. Underdog. How many of you remember Underdog. Yeah, how many of you have no idea who Underdog is? <laughs> yeah, I was actually uh, talking uh, to one of our young men here, and he said he loves Underdog, but he's never watched a single show. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, you watched the movie, though, right? But the movie was terrible. So don't watch the movie. Go back. I'm sure they're on YouTube or something. You can find some, uh, some good Underdog. Here's a, th- this one is slightly embarrassing. The next one is really embarrassing. Are you ready for it? He-Man, by the power of Grayskull. I told you it was embarrassing. So why do I bring this up? A, to make you feel better about yourself. And B, because what we're talking about is heroes this morning. Now, we're going we're gonna to dive into some better heroes than Underdog and He-Man, for sure. So grab your Bibles, and we're picking up the story in verse 32. Now, we've gone through a, quite a list of who's who, right? I mean, we've just finished. We've talked about guys like Abraham and Moses. And last week we talked about the people of Israel. And I think the writer of Hebrews got a little tired (laughs) because listen to what, what the writer does next. Verse 32. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. So what does the writer do now? Yeah, just starts a list and says, I'm not even going to tell you the whole story. So let's just briefly run through this list. And, and we're going to do both the good and the bad. This whole kind of message is about some good stuff and some bad stuff. So who's the first guy on the list? Gideon. 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 What did Gideon do? Yeah, he had the fleece. Right? God told him, I want you to go and attack the army of the Midianites. And Gideon was like, no, you got the wrong guy. I'm the lowest man on the totem pole in the smallest clan. And just to be sure, he put out a fleece and he did that twice. But what did he ultimately do? Yeah, he defeated the Midianites. Even though he was a little slow to act, he, God said, I want you to go defeat them. And when he finally decided to do what God said, they defeated the Midianites. All right. So next was Barak. Anyone know who Barak is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Pastor, this is your job. You tell us. All right? And by the way, these first four are all found in the book of Judges. So Barak was a judge who God said, I want you to go defeat the Canaanites. And Barak said, no, I'm not so sure. Until Deborah said, how about I support you? I'll come alongside you and kind of spur Barak on. And Barak then actually defeated the Canaanites. So Gideon defeated the Midianites, Barak defeated the Canaanites, even though, again, he was a little slow, he was a little hesitant, needed a little prodding, all right? The third guy, you all know, Samson. Samson. What did Samson do? He got a haircut. haircut. (laughs) I like that. Who did he, so we had the the Midianites and the Canaanites, who did Samson attack all the time? The The Philistines. He was always going after the Philistines. And yes, he was led astray. He didn't just get a haircut. Why did he get a haircut? <laughs> Guys, you're going to get in trouble. Because his girlfriend wanted it. That's exactly it. Yeah, he was the source of his strength. And Delilah led him astray, tempted him to do something that God 
told him you absolutely can't do. But even at the very end, even after his disobedience, he destroyed more Philistines. He was faithful to God. It cost him his life, but he still conquered the Philistines with his last breath. All right? Who's next? Here's a guy very few people probably know. Jephthah. Jephthah. Anyone know who Jephthah is? He's another judge. That's right. And what Jephthah is known for, he's known for two things. This is one of those guys, he, he's, a, he, he's a great character, but man, he was an idiot. I mean, literally, he was an idiot. Now, he defeated, are you catching a theme here? He defeated the Amorites and the Ammonites. And he told, here's what he did. He made a vow. He told God, if you will help me as a judge, defeat the Ammonites and the Amorites. By the way, did he have to make a vow for God to come and help him? No. No. He says, God, if you will help me, then when I get home, the first thing that walks out the door of my house, I will sacrifice to you. And so he went to battle, and guess what happened? He, he won. He defeated the Amorites and the Ammonites, and he got home, and guess who was the first person to walk out his door? By the way, because he had been victorious and walked out the door with a tambourine and worshiping and praising God and, and, and singing a song of victory for her father who had just won this battle. His daughter walks out the door. And guess what he does? He fulfills his vow. He has to sacrifice his own daughter. So I go back to my original statement. He's an idiot. Number, number four. Anyone know this guy? Yeah, no, it's not me. This is King David. Now, who did King David defeat? Goliath. <laughs> Goliath and everybody else. <laughs> Anybody else that got in the way, David defeated. Literally, the, the kingdom comes to its, its apex under King David's rule. He, he, he brings the nation of Israel together. He defeats all of the enemies of Israel. There's peace and prosperity in the land, which is exactly the moment when David blew it. Not only is David known for these great things that he did, but he's known for these, this terrible thing that he did. What did he do? I think it's hilarious in a way that the thing he's known for is committing adultery. But what did he do after the adultery? Yeah, he committed first-degree murder to cover up the adultery. It's terrible. And he's known as a man after God's own heart, the good and the bad, right? David's known as a man of great faith. And then finally, Samuel. Samuel is different than all these guys. What was Samuel? Samuel's a prophet. In fact, the writer says not only Samuel, but all the prophets. And Samuel was a pretty good guy. It's hard to look in Samuel's own life and see an area where Samuel messed up, except it wasn't necessarily him, it was his family that messed up. His sons blew it. His sons became prophets and priests, and they just, they just were terrible human beings. So he might have been a great prophet, but he was a horrible father. His sons would not have run up onto stage and said, Mom, Dad, right? Wasn't that awesome? I, I, hey, I just love being in a church, but that's all right. That little dude's awesome. All right, so we got this long list of people, and they're good and they're bad people, and we're adding them to a whole list of people that we've talked about this, this past month and a half. This is quite the list, isn't it? These are, this isn't just a list of people. This is a list of what? Heroes. Yeah, they're heroes. These are our faith heroes. We look at these men and women in this whole chapter, and we see, are they perfect people? No. They're imperfect, but there's some important lessons we can take from each one of their lives, both things that we should follow and things that we should be careful about, right? And that's kind of what we've talked about through this whole series. But not only that, not only the, 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 the six that we've talked about this morning or the rest of this whole list, there's some big picture lessons that we can take out of all of these men and women's lives, which is exactly where the writer of Hebrews goes next. The first lesson is that they did amazing things. So let's pick it up in verse 33. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. What does it say there? What was that last thing? They received what God had promised them. Hold on to that for a second. 
They shut the mouths of lions. They quenched the flames of fire and escaped death by the edge of the sword. By the way, when you start to look at that list of things that they did, is he talking about just the people on this list? No, he's, he's now getting even bigger. You use, let's use an example. Shut the mouths of lions. Who did that? Daniel, which is ironic because did Daniel do anything? No, what did Daniel do? He prayed literally for his life. He says he shut them out, but is Daniel even listed here? Nope. So he thought now the writer of Hebrews is going even bigger and saying all of these people in our past, in our history, did some truly incredible things. Their weakness was turned to strength. I love that phrase. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle, put whole armies to flight, and women received their loved ones back from the dead. Man, they did some incredible things, didn't they? I mean, you look at this list that they, we get here, and you look back over some of the people we're talking about. Did they do some incredible things? Did they do some things that we find hard to imagine? They do things that you wish you could do in your life? They do some things you need to have done in your life? Yeah, that's a great example. And the, the phrase I love out of this whole section is the fact that their weakness was turned to strength. When we look at that list of men and women, were they perfect people? Was there a perfect person on that entire list? Not one. Not one. They were all broken. They were all frail. They were all sinful. And it was actually their weakness that was turned to strength. And, and scripture continues this theme. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I just want you to listen to it. 2 Corinthians 12, this is a phrase many of us have heard before. Paul, this is Paul talking. I think I wrote the wrong verse down. I did. I don't remember what the reference is. You'll have to forgive me. But it's the case where Paul said he had a thorn in the flesh, right? And he prayed for God to remove that thorn. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. I will take your weakness and turn it to strength. Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. How many of you understand that sentence? Good, because I got to eat it. When you feel weak, do you feel strong? No, when you feel weak, what do you feel? Weak. God says, I take that and I turn it upside down. I will take your weakness, the area where you are the most frail, and I will turn it into my strength. I will do great things through you in the middle of your weakness. Isn't that great news? We're talking about how that happens here in a second. But that's not the end of the story. So we talked about all the great things that they did, but these men and women also faced some terrible trials. Let's continue. It says, but others of these men and women were tortured refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at. Their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hidden in caves and holes in the ground. That's quite a list, isn't it? I mean, you start looking at some of the things that happened to some of these people, some of our faith heroes. They're terrible things, aren't they? Yeah. Would we all agree that this last year has been a little less than ideal? Yeah. Anyone faced any challenges this past year? Yeah. Is our world going through some challenges and difficulties? Yeah. Is it anything like some of these things? Anyone in the room been sawed in half lately? Anyone had their backs cut open with whips, chained in prison, being killed by stoning or killed with the sword. These men and women went through some terrible things. And it's still not the end of the story. And by the way, Scripture also tells us that you and I will go through difficulties. James 2 says, Consider it pure joy when you go through trials of many kinds because God is improving. He's growing you. Does that bring anyone a lot of solace and comfort? When you're going through trials, aren't you like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that. How do we get to that place? Well, this isn't the end of the story. So did they do some incredible things? Yes. 
Did they face some terrible trials? Yes. But the writer of Hebrews tells us there's a reason. And there's a good news, bad news situation. So let me ask you, you want the bad news first or you want the good news first? Yeah, we always want the bad news first. So let's go to that. Verse 39. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. Remember when I told you to put a pin in something earlier? What did the writer say all these people had done? Back in verse 32. Or verse 33. No, where is it? <laughs> 33. 33. They received what God had promised them. And then later, what does he say in 39? None of them received all that God had promised them. Did they receive some of the promise? Yes. Did they receive all of the promise? No. There was still more that they didn't get to see. That's the bad news. Sometimes even when you have the greatest faith you could possibly have, you get some of what God has promised you, but you don't give it all. You don't get to see the end of it all. But the good news is why we had this bad news. The reason they didn't get to see it all, go with me to verse 40. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Why did God hold off on giving all of the promise? Whose benefit? For us. The of Hebrews says, look, King David and Joseph and Abel and Moses and all of the Israelites did not get everything that God had promised because if God had given it to them, we would have missed out. There was something coming. He says, something better was on the horizon. Each one of these people that we've talked about is flawed and imperfect. And here's the ultimate point. What is this? Here's the big question. What is this something better? There was something better that was coming for us, for you. What was the something better? I hear Jesus. Now let me ask you, are you saying Jesus because you know that's always the answer? <laughs> Jesus is always the answer, right? And what pastor is going to say? Nope, Jesus is wrong. For this answer, we got to go to the next chapter. So can we cheat a little bit and read two more verses? Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, what does therefore mean? What's the therefore, therefore? As Jake said this week. What is therefore about? The answer is what you already saw. Yeah, so this whole chapter that we've just talked about, it says because of all of that, because of all of those people, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. So we've been given this huge crowd of witnesses. Who's that crowd? Everyone we've just talked about, right? So King David and, and Abraham and Moses and Noah and Jacob and Enoch and, and Samson and all the prophets and Gideon and even Moses' parents and all of Israel. They are our crowd, this huge crowd of witnesses to what it means to live a life of faith. It says, because you've got that huge crowd of witnesses, what should you do? Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. The writer of Hebrews gives us this metaphor that you and I are running a race. It says, in this race, you need to cast off every weight. How many of you have ever run a race? Like, for real, you've run a race. Right, so what you do is you put on your moon boots and, and a pair of jeans and um, a heavy shirt and a parka and you go out and you run the race. How many of you would like to see someone run a marathon in moon boots and a parka? Yeah, I'd love to see that. Now, what do you wear? What's the real answer? Not the church answer, the real answer. If you're going to run 26 miles, what do you wear? As little as possible. As little as they will legally allow you to get away with. Because usually when they're running the race, it's hot. And even if it's not hot, I remember when I was preparing to run a marathon. I know it doesn't look like it now, but trust me, I have run one. And when I was preparing, it could be as cold as cold could be. You know what I was thinking? Thank goodness. It's so awesome because I'm going to get out there, I'm going to get hot, and I'm going to be able to stay cool. Now, there are some days in Colorado, it's just flat out ridiculous, and you just don't go run on those days. But you're going to get hot. So you don't want a lot of stuff weighing you down. You don't want to carry a big backpack full of weights. 
You don't even want to carry water, which is why they have stations all through so that you don't have to... You know that water is heavy? Like really heavy? Every ounce that you're carrying, you've got to carry not just for a mile, you've got to carry for 26 miles. And this race that you and I are running called life is a long race. It's an endurance race. And what the writer of Hebrews says is, you've got to cast off everything that's going to slow you down in this race. And run this race with endurance. And the number one thing that we have to get rid of, the thing that weighs us down the most is what? Our sin. It's our sin that weighs us down. Anyone ever had this experience? Your life is going along great, spiritually strong, you think things are good, and then some sin in your life creeps up, rears its ugly head, and you think, I am worthless. Why why do I even try? Everyone else seems to have this thing figured out, but I'm not sure I'm going to make it to the end of this race. I feel like I just disqualified myself. Anyone ever felt that way besides me this week? We've got to get rid of that stuff. The question is, how do we do that? How do we do this thing that he says? How do we run this race with endurance and strip off everything that's hindering us and slowing us down? He gives us the answer in verse 2. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. I want to read that sentence again. That should be underlined, highlighted, circled, take pictures of it, put it up in your house, share it on Facebook. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Here's what that verse tells us. All the examples we've been given about how to live our life of faith, don't follow them. Because were any of them perfect? Who is our champion? Jesus is. I love that, that, that phrasing. He is our champion. He initiates and perfects your faith. Initiates means he is the kernel, the start, the beginning of your faith, and he perfects your faith. He is the end. He is the beginning of your faith. He is the end of your faith. If you want to run with endurance, the race set before you, keep your eyes on him because he is your champion. He is the one who initiates and perfects your faith. Here's the bottom line. Make Jesus your faith hero and only Jesus. I should get at least one amen in the room. Make Jesus your faith hero. Your only hero. It's not underdog or he-man. Neither one. Underdog or he-man is going to help you in your faith. When you're faced with a sin that you don't know how to overcome. And when you blow it, what should you do? You should say, man, I'm just like Abraham. Just like Moses. I'm just like King David. I just blow it and I'm not perfect. No. You fall on your face before Jesus who is the champion and initiator and perfecter of your faith. And you say, Jesus, I'm coming before you and asking for you to help me with my faith. It happens all the time in scripture. Jesus getting on people's case all the time, especially the disciples. You have so little faith. But when Jesus saw great examples of faith, he pointed them out every time. Like the Roman soldier who called Jesus to come to his house to heal his servant. And he says, and Jesus is on his way. So he sends his servants. They tell Jesus, our commander wants you to come because his servant is sick. And while Jesus is on the way to go help, the commander says, no, you don't need to come from wherever you are. Just say the word. And I know what it's like to have authority and it will be done. And what did Jesus say in that moment? I've never seen such faith like that. That's the kind of faith Jesus wants us to have. Faith that, not that we have authority, but that he has authority. Not that we can overcome, but that he can overcome. Not that we have the power to heal, but that he has the power to heal. He is our champion, the initiator and perfecter of our faith. Make him your faith hero. Amen? Amen. That's how you run this race with endurance. That's how you overcome and get rid of the sin that so easily trips us up. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this this whole series and how it's helped me to think about my own faith, 
both my lack of faith and how I can have more of it. And yes, we go through this list of men and women who are great examples of faith. And they did it without you, Jesus. They did it before Easter. We get to do it after Easter. They did it before Jesus came along to make us right with God and give us a a right standing before God and a way to deal with the sin in our lives every single day. So Father, I pray that you'll help us, each one of us, to keep our eyes on you, the real hero, the one who starts our faith, who's the beginning and the end of our faith today and tomorrow and every day after that. Father, give us the faith that we need to accomplish anything that you've placed in front of us today. Let us make you our faith hero and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.